Okay, so welcome everybody um, to the Human Rights Centre Speaker Series. We have an absolutely fantastic event lined up for you today on feminist and queer approaches to international and transnational law. So I should probably introduce myself so you actually know who I am if you're not one of my students or alumni or colleague. So my name is Dr Emily Jones and I am a lecturer in the School of Law and Human Rights Centre and I work particularly on kind of gender approaches, feminist and queer approaches to international law. So I'm also going to be speaking today, so you'll hear a bit more about me anyway. Um, but yeah, we have some great speakers um, lined up for you all today, and I'm really excited about this event. Thank you all for agreeing to join us. Um, so and I would like to thank you all in particular for um, yeah, coming along today and also to Sophie and Katya, who are kind of in the background helping us out and making this event possible. So. Before I kind of properly introduce the speakers, I wanted to very briefly introduce the event, um, just very, very briefly. So I know um, at Essex we have, you know, we've been working more and more on our kind of gender and um, law courses. So we have um, our course on women's rights now, um, also gender, peace, security and the law. And we've been working more and more on kind of queer and LGBT rights and approaches. So this event is particularly important for us in kind of building that, but also bringing these sort of fantastic speakers who our students read throughout their courses to our student body. So that's really awesome. Um, yeah, we wanted to focus on, we kind of have this focus on international and transnational law, feminist and queer approaches. And really we wanted this event to be kind of how to do things, how to make things work in practice, you know, giving some examples, some ideas around theories and methodologies, because I think that's something that's really important and something that, again, students sometimes struggle with. It's, I like, I get the theories, but how do we actually put them into practice? How can we think about them, you know, as applied in, in, in research? So again, fantastic panel today who are gonna talk a bit about their work. Um, so we will have a Q and A session at the end. So do post questions in the Q and A, but um, you can post them whenever, but we'll be coming to them at the end. Um, so if you want to kind of think, oh, maybe I'll develop my question as people speak, then maybe hold on. Um, so, but do post the Q and A's as we go. So I am going to introduce our speakers in the order that they will be speaking in. They're each going to speak for around five to 10 minutes um, on various different topics in, in relation to this kind of broader theme. So first up, we will have Professor Diane Otto, um, who will be speaking about queer feminist approaches to international law. So Di is a professorial fellow at Melbourne Law School, and I mean, many of you, as I said, you, you know all of their work really well, actually, for the most part, or you'll be studying them this term with me if you don't, um, if, you're taking, if you're taking gender peace, security and the law. But um, she has done a lot of work in the field of public international law, human rights, particularly focusing on gender, sexuality and race inequalities in international human rights law, looking also at the UN Security Council's peacekeeping work, um, and looking at crisis governance and threats to economic, social and cultural rights and the transformative potential of people's tribunals and other NGO initiatives. And her recent book, Queering International Law, um, which came out in 2018, uh, is an edited collection and a really fantastic resource if you're interested in queer approaches. There we go, she's showing it for you all on the screen. Um, again, many of you are pretty, probably familiar with this book um, if you are in any of my classes. Um, but yeah, it's a really great book. If you haven't checked it out, I would recommend that you do. Um, so that is Di, she will be our first speaker. Next up, you'll have me. Um, I won't spend too long introducing myself because that would be somewhat vain, but um, I will be speaking about post-human feminist approaches to international law. Obviously, I work um, at Essex um, across feminist and queer approaches, as I said, um, and I actually have a book coming out in about eight days um, with Gina Heathcote, who I'll introduce shortly, and two others, our colleagues, um, Sarah Batotti and Sherry Lebensky. Uh, which is uh, the law of war and peace, a gender analysis, um, looking at kind of gender and conflict issues from post-colonial intersexual queer perspectives. So watch out for that one. Um, so following me up um, is Gina Heathcote, Professor Gina Heathcote, our new professor as well. So congratulations to her. Um, she's going to be talking about gender law reform, histories and methodologies. So Gina is a professor of gender studies and international law at the SAS School of Law, where she teaches international law and the use of force, gender and armed conflict and public international law. So in addition to this 
co-authored book that she has coming out with myself and others. Um, she also recently published um, her book, Feminist Dialogues on International Law with OUP in 2019. So again, another fantastic resource, which um, I'm sure many of you are probably already familiar with. If you're not, then definitely check it out. Um, and then last, but quite definitely not least, we will have Do Professor Prabha Kottisvaran, who will be talking about a twin approach to transnational law. So leading on quite nicely, focusing more with the international law approaches and then thinking more about transnational methodologies as we get towards the end. So Prabha is a professor of law and social justice at King's College London. Um, her main areas of research are, are pretty vast as well. So criminal law, transnational criminal law, sociology of law, post-colonial theory and feminist legal theory. So she has authored um, a book, Dangerous Sex and Invisible Labour, Sex Work and the Law in India. So again, a really key resource if you're interested in issues around sex work, um, a book that um, I often recommend to my students. But she's also co-authored the Governance Feminism book and then the kind of edit edited collection, which follows up from that, um, uh, which is Notes from the Field, the Governance Feminism book there, which Di is an author of as well. So that's nice. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've done a lot of work on kind of um, yeah social reproduction, which is her, her latest project, uh, sex work, um, post-colonial feminist perspectives. So another fantastic speaker. And I also just realized it's me and all the professors. So that's um, interesting as well. But I hope I can hold my own. Um, so, so to start us off, I would like to um, leave, give the floor to Professor Diane Otto, um, who will be speaking about queer feminist approaches to international law. So over to you, Di. Well, thanks, Emily, for that very generous introduction. And of course, um, you're rightly on this panel along with the rest of us. Um, for me, this panel is about the politics of law um, and trying to understand how international law works to reinforce unequal relations of power, of resources and knowledge, um, and how we as scholars and activists, because I think linking our work with activism in one way or another is also really important, how we engage with the law. Um, it's not only, a, well, to, the starting point, of course, is to make the politics of the law visible. Um, and I think this is an ongoing project. And by the politics of the law, I don't just mean its surface politics, but how politics have shaped its underpinnings, its conceptual framework, its analytical methods, and so on. Um, so we need to understand the politics of the law in, a, in order to, to challenge it, um, to challenge what's being taken for granted, to challenge um, the ways that things have normally been done, um, which largely have been naturalised, which is a very powerful way of normalising a particular um, mode of, of um, inquiry and fr uh, framework of law. Queer approaches to anything, I think, are not alternatives to feminist approaches or post-colonial approaches. I think queer approaches enrich other critical approaches and likewise queer approaches are enriched by other critical approaches. Um, I think what um, queer theory thinking brings to um, the, the mix is that it treats sexuality and analytically. Um, so for me, a queer approach or being a queer feminist is not just about seeking LGBTIQ inclusion in, for example, international human rights law. Not, it's not just about seeking recognition of our humanity by the law. Um, it's, it's about exploring sexuality of one of the vectors as one of the vectors around which power is organised. Um, I think queer approaches for me, or my kind of queer approach, also challenges gender duality, which is clearly linked with the feminist project. And as a, um, someone who's been a feminist for a very long time, it's I still find, I still fail to really be able to explain why, fem, why so many feminists 
why feminist thinking until relatively recently was committed to gender dualism. Um, I, you know, when the whole point of feminist work was that gender is um, socially constructed, it's, it's performative. And of course, that means that there can be many um, types of gender expressed um, by human beings and that gender can be fluidly experienced as well. Um, so I think queer theory, I hope queer theory along with feminist theory and post-colonial theory opens new ways to understand a, a legal problem and to imagine a more equitable future and the role that law may or may not play in achieving that. So in my work, to give you a couple of examples, I've one of the um, tropes, I suppose, um, that I've been interested in is the trope of the sexual panic. Um, Gail Rubin in the 1980s identified the sexual panic as a particular kind of locus of, of uh, power um, that can be used for purposes that are not clear or not even related to sexuality. Um, and clearly during the, during the period of colonialism, sexual panics played an important role in the colonizing sort of project by um, being a means whereby forms of sexuality and gender expression that were not consistent with the, the civilized European um, what, preference for or norm for, for um, sexuality to be confined to marriage, to be heterosexual, to be monogamous and to be basically reproductive. So a very disciplined um, approach to sexuality was um, imposed on um, the rest of the world uh, from Europe. And that's the very, that's the, the kind of sexuality that international law um, has promoted ever since um, in Europe, as well as um, outside in the, in the post-colony. We saw a sexual panic. Um, so that's a way of controlling and disciplining populations. Um, and we've, we saw another sexual panic operating in UN peacekeeping um, missions a couple of decades ago that's continued since then. And I think not only was that um, a means of imposing or supporting a very conservative sexual code in post-conflict societies, but it was also a means of distracting attention from the UN's failures, really, in terms of um, promoting um, a, a viable economic framework that offered real opportunities for people um, in relation to employment and education and so on. Um, instead, of course, these communities are living in dire poverty and sex work was one of the ways in which many women, especially young women, managed to survive. Um, and the policy adopted by the UN in the context of a sexual panic, of course, cut off um, that source of income for people. Um, my other interest has been to examine how the nation state itself is framed, is constituted, the, the primary subject of international law. And I've argued that it relies on um, the reproductive heterosexual um, family unit to um, produce and reproduce loyalty, kinship loyalties based on blood relations at that, in that, at that level, but loyalty in effect to the, the nation state itself. Um, I argue that heterosexual, that kind of heterosexual family relationship or family framework um, constitutes the nation state. I can talk a bit more about that later if someone wants to ask about it. So queer approaches, I think, added to feminist and post-colonial approaches help us to off 
help us to imagine different futures, um, to question the way that international law, like other systems of law, seem to almost inevitably reproduce inequality. Um, and instead, I think that a queer approach can um, promote human solidarities that are uh, that are not based on nation, um, redistributive economics and sustainable environmental practices, which of course I think that's probably a nice segue into Emily's um, comments on feminist post-humanism. Um, I think just one last point, I think queer approaches are not just concerned with um, the politics of heteronormative injury, Queer approaches are also concerned or interested in pleasure. And what that might mean in our work, I think is still something that uh, needs further exploration. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Di. That was a really great start. Um, lots, I have loads of questions for you now, but anyway. Um, so next up, um, we actually have myself. Um, so I'm going to follow up from Di speaking about post-human feminist approaches to international law. A bit weird that I'm chairing and speaking at the same time, but um, yeah, hopefully you can bear with me. So I thought it would be a nice kind of follow up from what Di was saying, because, you know, Di is obviously really talking about queer, queer in the kind of anti-normativity that comes with queer and that as a, an approach to international law. And, and I see some sort of affiliation with post-human feminism here. I mean, there are some crossovers and there are some things that are quite different as well. So maybe that's something we can talk about further in the discussion. But I've also set myself a quite hard task because post-human feminism, not everyone's gonna know what that means. And so I need to explain that before I can even talk about how it applies. So, um, so I'm gonna start off by doing this. I'm gonna look at, yeah, what is post-humanism? What does that mean for feminist theories and methodologies and then I'm going to try if I have time to give you a very quick example so see what I can do in uh, five to ten minutes but anyway so um starting off what is post-humanism and what is feminist about it really would be a good start so post-human feminist post-human feminism is not a legal theory originally it's kind of coming more from philosophy um feminist theory gender studies etc um, but I'm trying to apply it to international law, as are some others. So post-humanism really kind of critiques these two main things, both humanism and anthropocentrism. So I know I've thrown more isms at you, but I'm going to break it down. Um, so first of all, starting off with the critique of humanism. So this is really the critique of the human as being the central, sub the, the human subject of Western thinking. And this really fits with feminist legal theory because it's questioning who is that human subject that's at the center of our frames. So the kind of white middle class heterosexual able body man is very has very much been the kind of central legal subject um, and feminist legal studies has long shown this so there's some affiliation there between kind of post human feminism and feminist legal theory um, for me. But I also mentioned that post humanism challenges anthropocentrism too and this is kind of what Dai was referring to at the end in terms of environment. So anthropocentrism is really challenging this idea, the idea that the human subject sits in a hierarchy above and separate from all other subjects. So this kind of human arrogance. So the idea that humans are inherently superior and to animals, the environment, and also to machines. Um, so these pro approaches have kind of been less taken up within the law, I would say. I mean, obviously there are moments and there are kind of feminist legal theory moments where these things are engaged, but they kind of have a longer history in feminist thought through eco-feminism, so feminist um, writings on the environment, and also cyber-feminism, so ideas around kind of using technology for feminist futures. So in some ways, I see post-human feminism as, as very linked to intersectional feminism. You know, you've very much got this kind of post-colonial critique of, of who is the kind of central subject of the law that it has been prioritised. But also, methodologically, it kind of goes, it also kind of looks at different areas. It requires us to think also about technology, also weighted. Um, but the example I wanted to give, because I think it's possibly one of the easier ones to actually digest and think about is actually um, technology and thinking about autonomous weapon systems. 
So I know that sounds a bit weird, but I said that I want feminist approaches and gender theory and queer approaches to be able to speak to all of issues in international law. And, and that's why I think this focus on autonomous weapons is actually kind of, it's important to say, no, actually feminist and gender theory has something to say about this too, and can be used to rethink the regulation of these systems. So again, I have a quite a big task ahead of me because I first need to tell you what autonomous weapons are. Um, so these are broadly systems which can independently select targets and make life death decisions themselves. Um, they don't yet exist, arguably, um, but these definitions are actually quite unclear, and this is part of the debate in this sphere. So the debate here is very much, should we ban these systems? You know, is it just wrong to be saying that machines should be making life death decisions? Is there kind of something ethically wrong about that? Or, you know, should we actually, are we, should we actually use these systems because they can enforce, they can uphold international humanitarian law much better than humans can. You, you tell them what to do and, and they're not going to you know, have these problems with fear and they're not going to be, you know, their emotions won't be interfering with upholding these rules. So that's kind of the debate. And what I want to ask is, okay, what would a post-human feminist approach be? So as I said, post-human feminism, it kind of very much comes from, in the technology sense, this um, cyber feminist history. So this idea of um, using technology for to create a feminist future is very much present here. So a key voice that you might have heard of here would be Donna Haraway. So she talks about this in her Cyborg Manifesto. This is in the 90s. And she talks about how technology could you know, be used to challenge dominant understandings of subjectivity. So if the central subject of Western thought, of legal theory, of, of the law itself is the kind of you know, white, able-bodied, heterosexual male subject, well, technology is already challenging this idea that that subject is in, in charge of everything, is an individual bounded subject, because we are already cyborgs, is what she argues, we're already embedded with our technology. So that's already challenging the kind of boundaries that are kind of theorised around who the subject is. But she also notes that the problems with this, and, you know, I've started talking about autonomous weapons, you can already see that this could be really quite scary too, you know, and she talks about how, Donna Haraway talks about how this kind of technology could be used for this feminist future, but it could equally be used to create this kind of apocalyptic high-tech war. So we obviously want to avoid that, that um, future, so in what ways can a kind of post-human feminist approach help us rethink you know, autonomous weapons, which in many ways to, to many people, this the idea of these machines that kind of independently make decisions would be that kind of dystopian future. So post-human feminism, as I, as I mentioned, challenges this idea that humans and technology are separate and that we are somehow in control of this technology and superior to it. You know, Donna Haraway says we are all already cyborgs. The fact that I am so much, well, I'm talking to you through technology right now, but, you know, I'm so much using my phone all the time, we're all cyborgs. And this helps us understand autonomous weapons. Because the debate on autonomous weapons is we need to retain meaningful human control. That's kind of the, the thing that's put out there, you know, there's a lot of fear around autonomous weapons, and rightly so. But this idea of meaningful human control is what I want to kind of think about, because the debate is structured I mean, first of all, there's not really much of a definition of what meaningful human control is. So that's a whole other side debate. But, you know, if, if you see humans and machines as separate, then that kind of makes sense. You know, we need to retain human control over this. But if you take this post-human feminist approach and challenge the kind of human arrogance that we are in control of these machines and, and they kind of just do our bidding and, and start thinking about the ways we're connected to them, you see that a little bit differently. You know, you see the ways in which humans and machines are already collaborating to make life death decisions. So we can see this in drone warfare. You know, there's a lot of research that shows that, you know, the data that is collected during drone warfare creates a file that is, you know, eventually so large that sure, a human has to decide to, you know, say, well, we're going to conduct a strike on that particular person or that particular group. But once the file is so big that's being collected by the tech, is the human really making much of a decision if it's basically saying this person is definitely dangerous? Um, also, you know, it challenges the post-human feminist approach through this kind of challenging of the human machine binary. Also, 
allows us to see the kind of wider development. So not just drone warfare, but if we look at actual developments within military technologies, it's not really, states don't have that much interest in making a completely autonomous weapon system for now. The tech is not there. There are too many issues. But what we're really looking at is kind of actually enhancing the human. So through exoskeletons, so kind of metal skeletons that you can wear that make you stronger and faster, through two kind of technologies such as, um, you know, putting nano robots in the bloodstream so you can heal quicker, um, technologies which um, use kind of brain waves, stimulate your brain to um, learn things quicker, um, or so that, you know, if somebody is maybe um, a prisoner of war, they can still fly a drone from their brain. So they, you know, this poses issues for whether they're still a combatant or not. And I know I've thrown a lot of kind of high tech things at you in a, in a very kind of brief um, way, but those are just some of the ideas. So my argument really here is that if we take a broader approach, we note these human machine connections, we note the fact that you know, developments are very much this kind of enhancing human soldiers, we look at what's happening in drone warfare, well, post-human feminism shows that we need a bit more of a nuanced system. You know, disarmament discourse is very much ban or allow, is the human in control or is uh, are humans not in control? And actually, we need to think about this more broadly. And this may allow us to also think about a wider array of other technologies too. Um, you know, actually maybe question a bit further the ethics of drone warfare. So that, that's kind of where I wanted to go from there. And I know that I'm kind of running out of time. So a very brief introduction to what post-human feminism is and an example of some of the things that it can potentially do. Um, but if you have further questions, obviously do put them in the Q&A as well. We can address them at the end. So that's where I'm going to leave it for now. And I am going to next introduce our next speaker, who is Professor Gina Heathcote. He will be talking about gender law reform, histories and methodologies. So over to you, Gina, when you're ready. Thanks, Emily. Um, and I too. Um, I've been sitting here nodding my head. Um, so I'm feeling a bit unprepared. But thank you so much for the invite to join you today. It's a real privilege to be here on this panel. Uh, all of you have had um, really important um, roles in my own intellectual history, uh, both as reader of your work, but also as collaborator in different kinds of projects. And Prabhupada, I was thinking about when you set up the Feminist Legal Theory course at SOAS um, back in the day, and really proud and pleased to see some of uh, the students on the legacy course of that gender sexuality law here in the audience today. So shout out and welcome to all our SOAS students. Uh, and uh, how lovely to think about uh, the work that you did to get that off the ground many years ago. So gender law reform, history and methodologies. I have, have a caveat first, and that's that um, this is not a history project. Um, I think there is fantastic uh, archival work and theorization from gender studies scholars in particular, and, and that's not what I'm talking about today. Um, and there are amazing international legal history projects out there. Um, and again, you know, uh, this, that's not what I'm talking about today. I haven't changed track in my <laughs> trajectory of my research in that sense. Um, rather, I just want to talk about feminist histories in the simpler sense of seeing histories of feminist legal thought uh, that have constituted part of the conversations or much or all of the conversations that we're having today. And in this sense, when I'm thinking about feminist legal histories, um, two aspects, at least two, spring to mind. Uh, first of all, uh, a questioning of what is forgotten in our feminist legal histories, uh, in particular, um, when we tell the histories or the stories or the narrative of feminist legal um, scholarship in the US, in the UK, in Australia, um, the not quite the emotion, but often the forgetting of critical legal feminisms as if they've arrived now. I mean, I think of, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's work is often given a space and a mention, but the much richer uh, interaction uh, across theories of gender and race and the role of race always in feminist legal uh, theorizations, as well as non-Western uh, feminist legal histories uh, and how they become forgotten in our stories that we tell. So that's part of the histories uh, that I want to, what, what I'm invoking through the term history, but also uh, how feminist uh, or how legal reform tends to subsume and forget uh, the transnational feminist histories that often uh, initiate those law reforms in the first place. 
Uh, so in my own work on women, peace and security, uh, we see often the marking of Security Council Resolution 1325 issued by the Security Council in 2000 is the start of telling stories about women, peace and security uh, and a forgetting of the feminist histories of protests and agitation and organizing and interruption and challenging uh, the status quo of law uh, and uh, the politics of law to use the language that I used before. Uh, and how is it that law reform, gender law reform, uh, can play a role in the kind of forgetting of how the law reform got, came about? Before, before there was a law, uh, there was a feminist agitation interruption. Uh, one way of framing that, I guess, is to think about Hilary Charlesworth's distinction between methods and mes messages, um, which has always captured my imagination and I think is a really good way to think about gender law reform where she speaks about the messages of feminism often being uh, co-opted or picked up by uh, legislatures and parliaments or international legal institutions, but the methods of feminism uh, often mm. being forgotten. Uh, and I think going back to our feminist histories or uh, longer narratives, different narratives, plural narratives of feminism, uh, we might uh, think more consciously about the methods of feminism rather than just the messages. So my interest then is clearly in feminist legal methodologies, it always has been, and uh, I, it leads me to ask you uh, the following two questions. Um, and I want to ask this to all of you, uh, those in the audience uh, and my fellow panelists as well. How do we hold plural feminisms, and I'm using plural feminisms as a shorthand to hold the diverse conversations we're having here, the post-human, uh, queer, post-colonial, um, and well beyond, so just a recognition uh, that feminisms and legal feminisms are plural, they're not uh, contained or uh, one thing, um, but also I guess in using the word plural as a kind of nod to legal pluralisms as well and thinking about uh, the role of legal pluralism as uh, speaking to feminist uh, legal uh, methodologies. So how do we hold fe uh, plural feminisms feminist histories, uh, plural feminist knowledge, plur plural feminist frames within our turn to law. Uh, so how do we move uh, beyond using plural feminisms as a tool of critique to think about plural feminisms and law reform? Or do projects, uh, plural feminist projects, in fact, uh, like the work that uh, Emily's doing on post-human feminisms or Dai's work around prioritizing and seeing and rendering visible uh, queer feminist methodologies, do they ask us to turn away from law or do they ask uh, us new questions or do they remind us, thinking of feminist histories, uh, to come to law with slightly different expectations? I guess my partial answer to that question is about a deep structural uh, knowledge project that requires a decolonizing of our own perspectives uh, in relation to law so attention to legal pluralisms perhaps, but also a refusal of dominant uh, Western legal knowledge frames. But still that's a theorization. I wanna know what that means when we come to law uh, or is it a, a question that really leads us to a turning away from law? So what do plural feminisms uh, mean for gender law reform? That's my first question. My second question is, uh, and in a sense, I guess these are the questions that propel my own research. Uh, my second question is, if we accept that the messages, but not the methods of feminist legal thought or feminisms more broadly, have influenced gender law reform, and I think we can think of many examples uh, where the messages of some feminist voices have influenced uh, law reform and constructed gender law reform, do we need to ask, and this was my light bulb moment this morning, do we need to ask what else is held in those messages that are being kind of picked up by legal structures? Uh, so uh, what else is held in those messages? Di spoke to this, I think, uh, around the histories of sex panics, uh, thinking about gender law reform as a civilizing project, uh, as a reassertion of gender binary, uh, of a cis heteronormative space, uh, and uh, a species privileging as well. So is, I, I guess it's a question, but my, perhaps it's a question I know some of the answer to <laughs> all, always, but I, what else is held in the messages 
that filter into gender law reform asks us to our, uh, ask ourselves questions about our assumptions uh, within feminism around uh, in relation to civilizing projects and histories, the bi gender binary, uh, cis and heteronormative uh, uh, projects, but also perhaps uh, species privileging uh, in conversation with uh, Emily. And the second as aspect of this, uh, how do we talk about gender law reform with an embedded, embedded or response uh, a responsive kind of feminist methodology uh, to move away from just the kind of incorporation of feminist methods, uh, sorry, mes messages into law and to think more concretely about feminist methodologies as influencing law. And at this point, uh, I think about feminist transnational histories, uh, histories of protest, of interruption uh, and voice, uh, someone like Stella uh, Nyanzi uh, in Uganda and the work that she does in terms of protest and interruption, always a conversation with law, but also somehow out of law and built on um, a, a respect, I think, and a kind of responsiveness to feminist methodologies. Or the Manipur po protest, again, a feminist interruption to the status quo of the everyday and to law's complicity in uh, violence against women. But I think these are the tough questions to really ask how we hold uh, feminist methodology as a tool for gender law reform uh, that disrupts, I guess, the status quo of what we've seen in uh, the repetition of gender law reforms in the past. Um, so, um, so I've got lots of answers to this. I guess if I'm going to talk about plural feminisms, there are lots of answers and I don't think there is one answer. Um, but I'd be interested and I welcome you in to kind of talk talk and speak to what some of those might be. Um, sometimes I think the answers are outside of law, but I think many of our feminist legal projects, uh, if we hold on to histories of feminist protest, feminist transnational organizing, those outside of laws are responses to uh, and kind of are uh, legal projects in and of themselves. Uh, the translation into law, into gender law reform, I guess I want to ask about those translation moments and how we might do it differently. So one of my answers is uh, a quite crazy theory of interruption. I mean, I say crazy only because I'm not sure where it came from. Well, it does. It has its legacy in some Black British feminisms as well that talk about uh, politics of interruption and whether we might use the idea of interruption as a way to unsettle uh, Western knowledge and assumptions about the trajectory of modernism and the trajectory of kind of um, you know, how thought develops and, and actually rather than looking for smooth and kind of closed answers, interruption always kind of inserts uh, and asks for new sets of questions uh, as we go along. So I've got more on that, but I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to pass on to Prabha. Or maybe back to Emily first, I'm not sure. Oh, I, I could introduce Prabha maybe. <laughs> so thank you very much for that, Gina. And um, yeah, do keep sending your questions in. I see we, we have a few in the Q&A already. So um, after Prabha, we'll be having a Q&A um, session as well. So yeah, over to Professor Prabha Kotisaran, who is, will be speaking about a 12 approach to transnational law. So thank you, Prabha. Thank you so much, uh, Emily and Katya. This is um, this is really wonderful because it's an occasion for a reunion with uh, really uh, wonderful old friends and colleagues. And thank you, Gina, for that uh, very beautiful uh, kind of moment that you shared uh, around the introduction of the feminist legal theory course. I remember that I think when the course was presented uh, to the to the postgraduate board, I think the question was really whether feminist legal theory qualified as theory at all. And, you know, uh, so there was a lot of objection to the fact that this could be taught um, as a legitimate form of legal theory. And I think here we are after several years showing that it can be and it ought to be. And I think it's the kind of uh, work that we do as colleagues and as friends and in building institutions that enables these sort of interruptions to happen even within institutions. So I really, uh, value our, our friendship and our collaboration over the years. Um, so um, what I, I, you know, so the topic for my presentation is somewhat uh, ambitious. It, it's a twail approach to transnational law. Um, and by this, I mean, I'm not going to present you with a well-formulated twail approach to transnational law. Instead, I want to highlight the need for a twail approach to transnational law. And here I want to bring together uh, critical perspectives to international law in conversation with uh, critical traditions of thinking about transnational law. So I'll say a little bit about both uh, aspects, both about uh, a twail approach as well as you know what transnational law really is. 
So obviously, uh, but before I do that, I just want to uh, be very clear that I'm not an international lawyer by training uh, uh, or by practice. So really I'm quite new to the arena of, of, uh, of international law. Um, but nevertheless, I think I have some thoughts on how we can uh, uh, understand transnational law. So as many of you know, you know, third world approaches to international law is a critical uh, school of international legal scholarship that really tries to show how international law facilitates uh, you know, the continuing exploitation of the third world uh, through subordination to the West. And uh, many of my 12 colleagues uh, have undertaken quite um, uh, extensive re-examinations of the colonial foundations of international law. There are historical projects, there are more uh, political projects, there are more social legal projects within TWAIL. Um, and so, you know, although I'm not an international law lawyer, I draw on uh, some of the very same intellectual traditions that TWAIL draws on, in particular feminism, uh, but also socialist feminism and materialist feminism, as well as critical legal scholarship and American legal realism. Now, um, now I move on to what we mean by transnational law, and it is a term that Philip Jessup uh, articulated several decades ago in the 60s, where he talks about how transnational law um, is, he uses the term to designate all law which regulates actions or events that transcend national frontiers. So in a sense, it uh, encompasses public international law and private international law, but also, and this is key to transnational law, uh, also to other rules which do not wholly fit into such standard categories. So transnational law in a sense is, you know, sits in the interstices of sort of uh, public international law and private international law. Um, and it is something that has been discussed uh, extensively since the, the rise of globalization. Uh, and there's interest around various sort of strands of legal scholarship on this question. Uh, you'll see discussions around global governance, around global law, around global administrative law, uh, transnational legal studies, and also more recently, the study of transnational legal orders. So it's been very productive in some ways. Um, so what I want to draw on is, so a lot of this literature can be quite descriptive in terms of showing how globalization has fundamentally altered the way we think about the law. Um, but I'm more persuaded by certain critical traditions within transnational legal studies that really underline the continuity between law as it existed pre-globalization and its more globalized forms now. So uh, there is therefore, uh, it, it draws deeply from existing critical traditions um, uh, to the understanding of law, in, includes uh, social legal approaches, including uh, you know, an understanding of legal pluralism, so it's, it's not invested necessarily in, in showing that there is something new that's happening since globalization, but actually wants to also interrogate law, uh, international law and transnational law uh, going back, uh, you know, before the 1990s. So coming now to the question of a twail critique of transnational law, I mean, um, there, there is some uh, critique of this sort that you see in relation to commercial law, for instance, uh, by colleagues like Professor Sornaraja and uh, Prabhakar Singh. Um, my own twail critique is very interested in uh, a critique of transnational criminal law uh, to show how transnational law becomes a tool for Western hegemony. And here, I just want to say again that, you know, there is a distinction between international criminal law and transnational criminal law. And transnational criminal law was a term that was coined by Neil Boyster in 2003. Um, where he talked about how it is the indirect suppression by international law through domestic penal law of criminal activities that have transborder effects. So he distinguishes, so Worcester distinguishes transnational criminal law from international criminal law to say that, you know, international criminal law focuses on core crimes such as genocide, war crimes, uh, and crimes against humanity and so on. Um, and where international law holds individuals liable at the supranational level in, uh, you know, a range of hybrid and international courts. Now, in contrast, transnational criminal law covers a much wider range of offenses that draws on international treaties, but is focused on domestic implementation. So you can think of any number of uh, offenses such as drug trafficking and human trafficking and environmental theft um, and money laundering and piracy. Um, so in transnational law, so it, it, transnational law is interesting because it has what Boyster calls a horizontal element, which is to think of a crime suppression treaty 
that's uh, you know negotiated at the international level, and then there is a strong domestic uh, or vertical um, uh, part of transnational criminal law, which deals with domestic criminal law, which in effect operationalizes uh, you know uh, these suppression treaties. So what is interesting about transnational criminal law is really that there are some very striking similarities between them. Um, they often resort to draconian uh, measures. Uh, there's often a democratic deficit in the, in the way that they were negotiated. Um, there's often weak uh, institutionalization, uh, human rights abuses and collateral damage, uh, and also just the sheer ineffectiveness of criminal law with uh, quite low levels of conviction. But these often, these instruments often reflect the hegemony of the global north. So what I want to propose is that a twail approach really helps us um, understand transnational criminal law in a very comprehensive way. Uh, it exposes the constructed nature of transnational crime. Uh, it adopts a legal realist approach to uh, the criminal law to think about what are the other sets of background legal rules that could really be a better um, instrument to, to address uh, issues of exploitation. Uh, it helps us rethink comparative criminal law. And last but not the least, it helps us recognize colonial criminal law as uh, transnational criminal law par excellence. So uh, I'll just give a few examples about how um, I use uh, twail approaches in the context of examining transnational criminal law. So one example is around you know, transnational organized crime and the, the convention on this, which was adopted in 2000 and you know, protocols uh, which accompanied this convention, uh, both relating to migrant smuggling as well as uh, trafficking. So of course, um, it's not a coincidence that you know, it's 20 years after globalization and the free movement of capital um, and goods and services across the globe that you have uh, the introduction of these protocols, which really clamp down on human, uh, human mobility. Um, and we find that not only are these uh, you know, criminal law instruments conducive to um, you know, global capitalist projects, but also uh, have ideological benefits. So when you think of uh, trafficking, often it's easy to think about, you know, sex trafficking comes to mind. And there's a way in which the sexual panic that Dai spoke about is harnessed then to put women where they belong, which is within the home in their own countries, rather than allow them to migrate uh, across borders. So there is a way in which uh, these instruments really showed up the, inter uh, the interests of patriarchy, nationalism and, and capitalism. Similarly, if you look at the way now trafficking is being discussed, uh, it's being discussed in relation to labor exploitation. And here again, you see that um, there's an understanding of trafficking being a problem of the third world. It's both a problem for the third world because uh, it prevents them from becoming more developed. And it's a problem of development, which is that given that you have this vast informal economy in the third world, uh, somehow it appears that trafficking is inbuilt into the informal economy. So labor trafficking is viewed as a problem out there in the global south, uh, and it, it shifts attention away from the highly precarious forms of uh, work uh, that is performed in the global north itself uh, with you know, vast amounts of informalization. Um, so we can see that this whole idea of transnational crime itself is, uh, is constructed. And similarly, the responses to it are quite, um, you know, um, uh, there's a default to criminal law uh, because it helps secure state borders. But in fact, you know, you could think of uh, having more robust forms of transnational labor law. Um, you could impose more uh, uh, responsibilities on, on corporations, um, uh, you know, by having corporate due diligence laws and so on. So there are lots of different ways in which you can actually address the issue of uh, exploitation, uh, which happens in several labor sectors, but states will often just reach out to criminal law. So um, I'll, you know, I, I'm probably running out of time. So I'll just say that, you know, if transnational law helps us also price open the project of comparative uh, criminal law, you know, often there is a sense in which we think of comparative criminal law as just being, you know, comparing criminal law traditions of two countries, whereas in fact, um, all around you, you will see there's a whole range of discussions, um, say around you know sex work, where um, you know it's hard to pin the discussions around a particular international law treaty. But you'll in fact see that there's a very robust international community of activists, of lawyers, um, of governments that actually uh, 
draw extensively on each other so that you know the abolitionists who are against sex work will draw considerably on the Swedish model which criminalizes customers whereas those who are for uh, sex workers rights will promote the New Zealand model of decriminalization but there's actually no real way within legal scholarship of recognizing these conversations that are happening across uh, you know various epistemic communities uh, within and outside the law um, and um, finally I just want to say that you know if we think about uh, transnational criminal law um, you know it's often presented as a, a problem solver you know it's a, it's a uh, transnational criminal law comes in to solve problems around uh, money laundering, around you know a, a lot of uh, uh, negative effects of of globalization. Uh, it's it has this kind of do-gooder image, uh, whereas in fact transnational criminal law is an instrument of colonial hegemony. So if you think of uh, you know the Indian Penal Code of 1860, which was imposed um, in India during colonial rule, you also find that it uh, it found its way across to many different parts of the world. You know Singapore, Malaysia, Kenya. Uganda, Tanzania, Somalia, Sudan, and Aden. So you can see how colonial powers often used criminal law uh, to impose their hegemony all over the world. So actually colonial criminal law is a form of transnational criminal law. And conversely, we see that transnational criminal law uh, today uh, makes colonial powers appear to be beacons of progress. So you will often find the UK government promoting its Modern Slavery Act uh, as you know, beacon for the Commonwealth countries as a, a model legislation to addressing issues of uh, labor exploitation. Um, so we can see these you know, quite uh, interesting ways in which uh, transnational criminal law sanitizes projects of Western hegemony today, but also has very deep roots in, in colonialism. So I just want to conclude uh, by saying that you know, twail approaches to transnational law are necessary and they're, quite, they're immensely productive for imagining more emancipatory forms of uh, law in a globalized world. So I'll stop there, thank you. And sorry about the, the, the noise from the lawnmower. <laughs> no worries, thank you very much, Prava. That was fantastic and led on very nicely from what um, Gina had to say as well, I think, so that was good. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for coming along and thank you to our panelists and thank you to Katia and Sophie for also being in the background and making this happen. So thanks everybody.